Welcome to our next session. This session is bring by Logan, and he's going to share with us the Log4j security patching lessons. We all know Log4j is uh, was famous that impact a lot of users. Today, he'd like to share with us the lessons he learned from the security process. Let's welcome him. And Logan, do you want to say hi to everyone? Yes, I would like to say hi to everybody. And thanks to you, as well as the program committee, Yinde and Mark, for having us here. Um, as far as I know, we are, it's the first time that uh, people from Africa actually speak at a Taiwan, Taiwanese conference. And we look, look forward to it. We are really honored to have you here. And let's give him a big hand. So thank you to Cuscup. So I'm going to talk about Log4G security patching lesson that we in Mauritius through the Cyberstorm team came up with. So I'm Logan from the Cyberstorm team. We work a lot on IETF protocol, both on the design side and implementation side. So for me, again, it's a great Can honor to be video, here in Taiwan. So what is Log4j? Log4j is a logging library. Due to the fact that it's been here for a long time, it has become the default choice for many Java developers. It made the headlines in December due to major security flaws that were uncovered inside it. So just a little bit of history about Log4j. So it, it essentially started up as a really simple library just for doing logging. But over time, more and more features got added to it. And the more complex the software become, the more likely it, it could be, lead to security flaws. So one of the ideas that increasingly is becoming um, important is that complexity breeds security flaws and it's important to find them and actually fix them. So in Africa, when the log4j security flaws made the headlines, you know, they were just one as, you know, one flow made it, another flow was published. So many of us started getting worried. And many of us, we work at companies that have some kind of Java code. And we started realizing that due to the transient nature of dependencies in Java, there could be several packages affected. It was at this point that actually called several of the cyber storm the Temu team and said, you know, I think we've got a major problem on our hands. And it seems that due to it being December and many people are on vacation, we need to somehow step up from Africa and actually help with a thought in terms of fixing all of those dependencies that were relying on a vulnerable vulnerable version of log4j. So we started this hackathon called log4j and we basically went out hunting on GitHub and looking for security flaws um, for different packages that rely on log4j. So Operation L4g started. We originally started it in Mauritius there were several open source packages that were patched, well over 30. We celebrated Christmas and New Year while watching GitHub mergers and feedback from the patches. And it was a really fun experience, despite it being end of a year. And many people were in a different mood because of Christmas and New Year. So in large part, this 
hackathon was inspired by Operation Rosa, which is a which was a similar hackathon that was done by Google engineers because they realized that at the time one of the major Java libraries similar to Log4j suffered from a security vulnerability and there were so many packages that you had to update on GitHub. So Google actually launched Operation Rosehub and there are a lot of similarities between what happened during Operation Log4j and Operation Rosehub. So the other project that we like to inspire ourselves from is the OpenBSD project, which unlike a lot of open source projects, tends to focus a lot on finding security flaws instead of adding adding features over time that leads to complexity. And as I said, complexity leads to security holes. So um, you may know the OpenBSD project because they produce OpenSSH, which is, a, which is the SSH that everybody uses. And we also produce LibSSL, which is a fork of OpenSSL uh, with a lot of code removed and a more modern code base. So uh, we were really inspired by both of these um, large uh, open source project and companies. So a typical example of what we did was um, we went through the Apache library, uh, Apache GitHub organization. We basically look around for anything that has uh, vulnerable version of log4g and we submitted the pull request and it didn't take long for them to just accept it. Um, so as you can see, the pull request was submitted on the 19th and on the 17th of January, back when everybody was back, they just pulled out the pull request. So this is a typical example of what happened, right? And there are many, many open source packages like this that, you know, you'd never thought they would be using log4j, but turn out that they do. But it's just a question of someone actually going around and figuring out from their dependency tree whether they are using a vulnerable version of log4j or not. So what are the benefits from a geopolitical perspective? So. Africa is seen as being active during log4j security crisis. It also shows that despite many African countries still being ranked as developing countries, we can still contribute to a certain extent. It would make certs in Africa more relevant because they actually can feed useful information such as say, here are the list of vulnerable Java libraries that need to be updated because of a version bump that includes log4j version bump. So I think that this kind of information flowing from the search in Africa into the search of Europe and the US is something that's useful to have. So Africa has often been seen as a passive follower or a passive adopter of technology. But here we're trying to change back because we're actually a contributor to the technology, not only uh, an adopter of technology. And we believe that there's actually value in terms of higher level skills in doing that. And we are actively trying to encourage people around Africa to actually do the same. So there are a few interesting challenges like there's some libraries that we send them saying, hey, you guys need to update your log4j due to some security hole, and they didn't respond. Um, as you see, the pull request was made on 13th of December, and six months later, still nothing happened. So those are the open questions, and we feel that I'm going to the next slide. So unmaintained libraries could become a problem because open source doesn't call back saying, hey, I'm using it. You, it might be embedded into some kind of appliance. It might be in your phone. But the problem is that it's unmaintained. 
So typically, the US developer in US or Europe worked on it. He's paid some amount of money. Typical salary, I think, is 10,000 USD per month for a typical US developer. And once he moves out to another company, he may not be contributing to that library at all. So there are a lot of those unmaintained libraries that seem to have a large number of adopters, but nobody's actually maintaining them. So some, some of the questions we thought asking is that developing countries have developers, have a lot of, for example, Java developers, but could we look at moving the maintainership and finding a way of sustaining this effort in a developing country, um, either through companies in Africa who would be sponsoring developers or uh, companies in Europe or the UK would, you know, would find somehow a way to support developers in Africa who are doing this kind of work either through GitHub sponsorship or Patreon page or some kind of, um, some kind of um, foundation. So companies are adopting open source software, but they don't have an inventory of what they use exactly. And this is a case even for companies in Africa. We pull out code from different parts of the world on from GitHub, but we don't have an exact inventory. So software building of material or any open source packages that help us track dependencies are useful. I think one of the end goals would be to have something that, you know, alerts you whenever a dependency is um, contains a security vulnerability internally. I think this is much more um, useful. So the Open SSS initiative was announced and we welcome it. But it seems to be very US centric in the sense that it seems that it's hard for uh, African companies to get involved because there's not, like most of the conferences are happening in the US and there's some online communication through Slack. So we hope that it's going to be a global initiative, not only a US centric one. Um, and we think that with the help of a US government, it's important to also show that government from developing countries are somehow interested to get involved. Uh, so, we, but when we joined on the online chat, we did receive welcoming words when we joined. That's a good sign. We are closely watching our progress and how African and countries and companies can be part of this. Um, either through donating labor or uh, pushing in money or things like that. Uh, we think that's the next step forward. So I would like to thank all the organizers who invited us here, Costco, the whole of the team, Mac uh, and the rest. Um, I would like to thank all the Cyberstorm, the Temu team who spent their uh, holidays actually patching Log4j across the, the globe through GitHub. So Bruno, Nathan, Jagvia, Chandish, Alex, Neil, Terry, Jeremy and Rahul. And we also like to thank all the developers who were responsive to our patches and actually took out the code. And um, at one point they were like, oh, another CVE for Log4j. But, you know, they knew that we were there. We were actually watching out. And we got, so we actually made special stickers for that particular event, this hackathon, and we had online orders from around the world for our stickers, which was uh, surprising to us. Um, yes, <laughs> that was fun. For us, that was uh, fun. But again, there are some open questions, like how are we going to support the open source security efforts moving forward? We hope that open SSF is the answer to this. And we are happy to take any questions that you have.
Okay, thanks for Logan's sharing. And we got few few questions from audience. Um, but I myself have one one question for you first. You mentioned about the software bill of materials, S bone, right? Correct, yes. Yes. And um I think there there is a project called Open Chain that is uh, support to the software compliance, and they want people to to have their software bomb. I I'm not sure if you know this or not, and I just like to share with you the Open Chain project that is under the Linux Foundation. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. We've heard of this. Um, we are quite, I mean, I think it's clear that there's consensus within several open source projects, and I guess that's why the Linux Foundation took it upon themselves. Uh, we certainly look forward for building our material to become not only um, a Linux Foundation initiative, but also become like, um, a global part of companies around the world. Because aside from the large companies, there are also several companies that are online that provide online services. And at one point, I think that they also need to look at adopting uh, that technology in particular. Um, I've spoken to people around Africa, and you'll be surprised that many CEOs do not know, for example, what SBOM is about. So even though it's a very old concept, um, it needs a little bit of more, uh, I guess, push or marketing. Okay, thank you. And let's see what audience asking. When fix the security crisis, the time is critical. And how do the team balance the speed and the code quality? So this is a very good question. Um, so it depends on the open source project that we look at. So some of them had um, CI CD systems that just made the testing easier. Uh, there were others where uh, some of that was uh, not present. So we had to do some uh, testing before like writing uh, some kind of uh, test code. Uh, to actually make sure that you know um, the change to a new version of log 4G uh, wouldn't cause any kind of regression. Um, so yes, there was this aspect of patching as fast as possible, but at the same time, uh, making, making sure that we didn't break things. And that was a balance, depending on the open source project that we're looking at. OK, thank you. And we have another question. Do you have any future plan to encourage people around you to join the open source activities? Yes, that's a, again, very good question. Um, from Africa, there are like several conferences. Um, one of them is, the, uh, for example, the African Internet Summit where there are typically like hackathon activities. So that would be uh, a useful venue. Also from different African countries, there is increasingly like conferences around open source. It's mostly about um, explaining technology, but we're actually pushing for more hackathon type of uh, tracks during those events. Uh, in South Africa, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in all of those countries. And there seems to be um, interest in making that happen because of the sheer number of people that actually contact the Cyberstorm team from over, over African countries and want actually to, to have something similar to that. And some of them actually even invited us to uh, their, for example, their network operators group meetings, their 
open source uh, meetings. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's this, there's this rise in Africa of moving to the next stage of not only adopting open source technology, but actually contributing to it. It's just a question of figuring out how to uh, make it happen and in a sustainable way. Okay, thank you. And I think people in Taiwan doesn't have many experience to join the join a open source related conference or activities. And but I think we were looking forward if we have chance to exchange the experience with you. We certainly look forward. I mean, when I look at Taiwan, um, I, I see a country which is very active in open source technology in terms of um, there are a lot of companies that are uh, developing hardware in Taiwan and you guys do to be doing really well over there. And in terms of also device driver writing because a lot of device drivers uh, actually come from you guys. Um, agreed though it's uh, still a very small type of uh, like it's a very uh, specific domain specific type of open source activity but we'd certainly look forward to um, like if people from Taiwan want to help during the next security crisis we certainly look forward to collaborating with you guys um, and for us I mean when we look at Taiwan the sheer number of conferences that the number of it appears that the number of open source project that are going forward, I, I would see, it would seem to us that you guys are actually ahead. Okay, we still have time to few more questions. Any question that haven't asked, you can raise your question now. No, then, okay, I think that's thanks, Logan, to join us again. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand again. Okay, thank you. See you. See you.